Good morning, everybody. This is Jim Ransom, uh, bringing you another episode of Morning Jim. I just needed something to do while I was having my coffee every morning, and so I thought once a week I'd do this. We've moved here in Kansas from the pleasures of Indian summer uh, to the throes of winter. From 85 degrees on Thursday, two days ago, to a temperature this morning of, let's see, 38. But that's typical of the prairies. Uh, the fronts come from the south. The fronts come from the north. And we never know whether to put on our short sleeve shirts or our long underwear at this time of the year until we look at the weather forecast. Uh, some wizard will suggest that this is what happens with global warming. Really? <laughs> it's been like this for the last how many hundreds of years? I don't know, but um, it's all too complicated for me, so I'm going to slip away and read you some fall poetry. <clears throat> Here's a book called um, Stage, Stage Whispers by Roy J. Beckmeyer, a Kansas poet. And uh, Beckmeyer's poetry, I think, is excellent and not widely read outside of Kansas, unfortunately. But for those of us from the middle part of the country, the prairie states, <clears throat> a lot of his poems ring true. And here's one called Collie County October. Virginia creeper spatters the hackberries along Grouse Creek with splashes the same rusty color as the old man of a pump jack up on the crest of the hill. The cloisonne face of a cock pheasant slips between bronzed shafts of bluestem. A plume of dust chases a pickup but can't follow it over the bridge. The smell of parched um, leaves drifts through the golden tracery of cottonwood trees. At the pool below the run, abstract impressionist carp swirl temporary images of distant spiral galaxies onto the surface of the creek. <clears throat> I, th I think this is a great poem and um, uh, I hope you caught the fact that uh, the old man of a pump jack is talking about an old rusty oil pump head, uh, uh, oil head that's been uh, locked off up on the crest of the hill. <clears throat> uh, and the cloisonne face of a cock pheasant. I think most of you know what a cock pheasant looks like, but um, it's got a lot of red, blue, and iridescent green on it, along with some white. So a cloisonne is a good way of describing it. And the reason the dust doesn't cross over the bridge is because the surface of the bridge is concrete or asphalt. That's pretty clear. At the pool below the run, abstract impressionist carp swirl temporary images of distant spiral galaxies onto the surface of the creek. Of course, he's talking there about the fact that in the shallow, clear water, he can see carp. <clears throat> but when he um, frightens them, they uh, get the heck out of there and create a cloud of dust swirls from the bottom of the creek, uh, which looked to him like a distant spiral galaxies. I think that's, I think that's great. And um, I'm going to read another one of his poems. This, this book has uh, uh, over a hundred pages and it's got lots of poems. I don't know exactly how many, but <clears throat> a lot of them. 
This poem is called Winter's Weft, and uh, it's a perfect poem for the kind of weather we're having right now. Uh, weft, of course, you'll have to maybe look that word up. It's, it's a part of the vocabulary of weavers. Winter's Weft. As we stitch these days into the garland of time that binds us to this hallowed place, as we search for patterns in this far stand of wind-woven grasses, the prairies lace, as we draw from our allotment of tears and wind chills and storms and snow-splattered sky, as we use each other to allay our fears and brace one against the other to get by, let us look up and find that calm north star, the world's pivot about which we all whirl, we'll watch stars rise and fall, some near, some far, and listen as coyotes wail and squirrel and weave this winter as the night air clears into the wreath of our apportioned years. Beautiful. And as many of you have probably picked up, because we discussed this last week, this is a sonnet. A sonnet is 12 lines divided into four stanzas, <clears throat> followed by the 13th and 14th lines, which are a couplet. And in this poem, the couplet at the end is, and weave this winter as the night air clears into the wreath of our apportioned years. This poem is notable for the fact that <clears throat> it it takes the appearance of winter and connects it with our our lifespan and it also uh, has a lot of nice uh, rhymes but they don't overwhelm the poem they're kind of quiet and they don't uh, take up too much of our attention. And that's the way I like rhymes. I don't like rhymes that da-da-da-da-da-da-da at the end of each line there's a loud rhyme. No, no. Uh, these rhymes are very, very nice. Let me read the first stanza over again. As we stitch these days into the garland of time that binds us to this hallowed place, as we search for patterns in this far stand of wind-woven grasses, the prairie's lace, and that goes on to the first line of the next stanza. Garland and stand and place and lace rhyme, but you're not strongly aware of that, but it makes the poem beautiful. Okay, <clears throat> now I thought I'd read you another October poem. It's not from a book, it's one that I've written since my book of poetry was published. And it's called Odd October. Um, this little poem about October in our place talks about an early snow. So let me read it. Remembering the recent visits of our dwindling sun and defended by the deep warmth of autumn earth our streets are passable and clear, but the roofs of houses and cars and the grassy lawns surrender themselves to winter's early blast of snow. An odd outdoors, with the leaves still clinging to the twigs of trees, the reds of maples and the purple oaks fly in the morning breeze like Empyreans still clinging to retreating autumn like last defenders of a lost battle. Yeah, um, for word collectors, the word Empyrean means flag, but more precisely a battle flag. Uh, perhaps that's what we need for winter every year. And the imagery here is of leaves still clinging to the leaf, to the twigs of trees. We're going to see that in the next few days when 
winter finally comes and we get some really cold weather and some snow is forecast. And of course, as many of you are aware, the concrete of our streets and roads holds heat for quite a long time. <clears throat> and so when we get a scroll of snow in the early fall, it will stick to the lawns and to the roofs and uh, the bushes and so on, but it won't be on the roads. It'll melt fast because of the heat still held by the concrete. Okay. <clears throat> Our humor today comes from the poetry of Ogden Nash. I miss him. I really do. Everybody's so serious nowadays, even including our poets. Not me, of course, but... <laughs> um, Ogden Nash cures that. Her, he used to in the days when he was in his heyday. Now, on the cover of, of this book which I purchased many years ago in the 1950s. There's actually a picture of Ogden Nash, a sort of a likeness of him, sitting in an easy chair uh, and writing his poems. But what's that in his lap? It's a typewriter. <laughs> no, no, we don't use those anymore, do we? Um, now, there's something else that's a little different about this book. This is a hardbound book, but look at the price in the corner. A dollar forty-five a copy, it says. Try buying a hardbound book today for a dollar forty-five. You're <clears throat> not going to be able to do it as you will. No. That doesn't mean that Books are more expensive, actually. It costs about the same, maybe even less, to make a book nowadays than it did back in Ogden Nash's time. But what it does tell us is that um, the dollar is worth a lot less. Um, yeah, I, can co I come from the day when you could buy candy for a penny. <laughs> and... A large Hershey bar, much bigger than the ones they're selling today for a dime. So, money, money cheapens, but things are always worth the same effort that it takes to make them. Um, here's the first little poem by Ogden Nash. It's called The Song of the Open Road. I think that I shall never see a billboard lovely as a tree. Indeed, unless the billboards fall, I'll never see a tree at all. <laughs> that comes from the days when uh, the highways were lined with billboards, especially as you got close to uh, a city. And finally, we did get some rules about billboards, and they vary from state to state. And they mostly apply to the interstate highways. But <clears throat> we used to have a lot more of them, and that's what Ogden Nash was writing about. Here's another poem called Samson Agonistes. I test my bath before I sit, and I'm always moved to wonderment that what chills the finger not a bit is so frigid upon the fundament. <laughs> yes, very true. Samson Agonistes means Samson, the biblical Samson, the strong man uh, in agony. And Samson Agonistes actually uh, was uh, a part of a poem by John Milton back in uh, 16th century England when he was writing. He had the character Samson Agonistes. And of course, Ogden Nash, having gone to a university 
in the 1920s would have probably been exposed to a lot of John Milton, which is more than most of us can say in this day and age. <clears throat> After all, we've got to learn about intersexuality, don't we? I mean, an intersectionality and a lot of really good stuff like that. Okay, that's enough for today. Somewhere the weather is summery. I hope you're there. We were there the day before yesterday, but somehow we left. Next week, I'll probably read a poem or two by W.H. Auden and maybe something by Robert Frost. Oldies but goodies, I call them. Until then, smiles and blessings to you all.